Uh, thank you, Reshma, and also I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and at the IHES. Um, so just in brief, my lab works at the interface of biology, uh, engineering, and technology development, uh, where we are particularly interested uh, in developing technolo molecular technologies and genome technologies to reprogram genomes as a platform to probe biological function as well as expand uh, biological function. Um, so on the topic of genomics, I wanted to first sort of set the stage uh, by first uh, acknowledging the quite the revolution that we've been, uh, that we've all been experiencing over the past decade or so in the advent of next-gen sequencing and the impact it's had on uh, biological research. Uh, in particular, with the ability now to generate scores of uh, data sets, we can really uh, gain a much better understanding in genetic variation. In particular, uh, starting to get a better sense of the um, genetic vari vari variants that are associated with specific phenotypes or disease. Uh, and clearly, this is fueling a tremendous amount of uh, effort and insights stemmed from uh, genome-wide association studies as well as impacting many other areas of uh, biological research. But what's interesting is that the data that's generated from these types of next-gen sequencing efforts really establish long lists of sequencing or uh, genetic mutations that are implicated or associated with certain phenotypes. And so there are opportunities to really drill down and, and, and understand uh, and a much better understanding the uh, impact or the causal relationship between genotype and phenotype. And this is where we believe that the uh, prospect of writing genomes would immediately be able to allow us to test a lot of the hypotheses that are being generated from these next-gen sequencing data by being able to functionally create these genetic modifications and their combinatorial variants to really gain a much deeper connection between genotype and phenotype, ultimately le leading to a causal understanding. Uh, clearly, there's uh, many other implications and applications that you can uh, harness from the ability to write genomes, those being possibly the treatment of human disease, and we're seeing lots of that clearly uh, being discussed over the past few years. And in the context of a lot of the work that we're doing, uh, using this really as a platform to engineer synthetic biological systems. Um, and in many respects, I'd like to sort of invoke this nice quote by Saul Bellow, which, which nicely encapsulates the spirit of research in the lab, where we sort of think ourselves as um, uh, as writers who are readers, they're moved to emulation. So as you've heard throughout the course of the week, uh, many of us also think about biology as a technology, really engineering and harnessing the uh, diversity and the power of biology as a, as a platform to change really the basic fabric of society, the way we produce medicines, food, energy, chemicals, and materials. Uh, clearly, I won't, har I, won't, I won't harp on this, but really acknowledge that a lot of this really stems from recombinant DNA technologies that were primarily uh, developed in the 1970s and until recently really have, have not seen much improvement. However, they have led to a lot of production of high value compounds. Clearly, one of the hallmark uh, examples being the first introduction of, uh, rec of uh, recombinant insulin uh, in the late 70s, which obviously has had a big impact on the treatment of, of diabetes and a number of instances throughout uh, the past 40 years or so uh, to really um, harness some of the some of the power of common DNA technologies. Over the past uh, 10, 15 years, people have used these types of approaches to uh, co-opt or re-engineer native metabolism to convert cells into little factories for producing high-value compounds. Here's an example that uh, stemmed from a collaboration between DuPont and Genicor in the late 1990s to convert E. coli into a little factory for producing a new type of a of a material, in this case, 1,3-propanediol, and we heard a little bit about this from uh, Sven yesterday. But in brief, what they basically did is they ultimately uh, uh, isolated a, an engineered strain of E. coli containing about 27 changes that was quite successful in converting a 98% theoretical, theoretical yield of glucose into 1,3-propanediol. This is great. However, along the way, they went through literally thousands and thousands of strain variants to isolate this, uh, this uh, top strain. And this really took over a decade and tremendous resources to, to, achieve, to achieve these goals. So in brief, one thing I want to just impress upon you is that engineering cells to make stuff, whether it's 1,3-pip and diol or scores of other things that we've heard about throughout the course of this week or 
in the, in the in news uh, really takes a tremendous amount of time and effort and resources to get there. So this kind of sets the stage for how we think about some of the key challenges in engineering biological systems. The first clearly being that biology is complex. And I think it's important to appreciate the complexity and how much we've yet to understand about uh, how these systems function collectively to uh, confer the phenotype, the phenotypes that we're observing. This is confounded in the context of engineers who are trying to introduce, introduce new biological function, really co-opting these natural systems and really fighting that upstream um, process of evolution. Uh, those few examples from industrial biotechnology really highlight our inability and the cost associated with really converting cells into factories for producing high value uh, products. And in particular, I'd like to emphasize that I think a lot of these efforts are really limited by technologies that we have to probe and engineer organisms. And by this, I mean being able to really develop and deploy large scale technologies to create scores of target modifications across genomes, being able to at will modulate the expression of any gene uh, or alter um, metabolism. Uh, complementary to those is being able to be able to detect and respond to changes in important expression of genes or changes in metabolites, for example, and then being able to engineer uh, and regulate in response to that. And the last thing I'd point out is with the fast pace that the field of synthetic, of synthetic biology is moving, it's important to also consider uh, safety and security aspects of GMOs. And here I've sort of raised two examples of what we're thinking about with regard to safety and security. First being uh, the stability of biofermentation processes. So a few years ago, in the summer of 2009, Genzyme, a, uh, one of the world's leading orphan drug manufacturers in Cambridge, Massachusetts, faced a pretty daunting problem where their biomanufacturing uh, pipelines for two orphan drugs was compromised by viral infection, wiping out the world supply of these orphan drugs for uh, the better part of six to nine months. <clears throat> this is all due to basically virus contamination. So clearly there's a need to create uh, biofermentation processes that are more resistant to contamination and more stable. Similarly, uh, as efforts in synthetic biology moved and transitioned from more uh, physically contained systems to applications and open systems such as the clinic or the environment, there's a growing need to consider uh, addressing challenges, challenges of intrinsic biocontainment or basically limiting the growth of engineered organisms to synthetic devi defined environments. So what I'll uh, now do is sort of transition to focusing on some of the technologies that we've been uh, uh, developing over the past few years with an eye towards addressing some of these challenges that I just outlined. So the first being is how do we really improve our ability to uh, uh, modify genetic material? And clearly, as I, I mentioned briefly, most, most work until the past five or six years has really stemmed from um, uh, nuanced improvements of conventional or common DNA technologies that date back to the 1970s, where you effectively rely on really serial and inefficient modification of DNA, uh, allowing single or few genetic modifications. To a certain extent, you can paralyze your efforts, but the amount of sequence space that you could sample is very limiting. And so what we've been really been thinking about and driving is the idea of uh, geoengineering with the goal of introducing in parallel site-specific efficient changes across whole genomes. And in the process, exploring combinatorial genomic sequence space. So both as a way to re-engineer and reprogram cells um, to explore a new function, but also as a technology to really gain a much deeper understanding and, and establish causal relationships between genotype and phenotype. So just to sort of think about this a little bit more, we think about being able to introduce large-scale gene modifications as a way to um, lead to disruptive and novel, and novel fitness landscape. So if you consider sort of your genotype space over here, and you can think about uh, what evolution is trying to do, which is maximize fitness, or what the engineer is trying to do is to drive towards a very well-defined prescribed phenotype, you can think about sort of the scale of what you're able to do sort of in a, in the case of a single gene type of engineering problem, you can really sort of sample a very small piece of that uh, genetic or, or phenotypic landscape. As you move towards a network, you could start to explore larger landscapes, but it's really the prospect of being able to uh, modify the whole genome that, will, that really allows you to really sample uh, entire genotype, genotype phenotype landscapes. 
And so this is where uh, we've witnessed a lot of really powerful technologies uh, being presented over the past few years. I like to sort of bucket them into two, into two key categories. One is synthesis and one is editing. And so you could see, obviously, a tremendous amount of effort has been uh, presented over the past few years uh, out of both the Venture Institute as well as we'll hear later this afternoon in the context of some of the uh, uh, yeast 2.0 efforts to effectively resynthesize entire genomes. Uh, others, including our lab, have worked uh, to develop technologies such as multiplex automated genome engineering or MAGE, as well as obviously the advent of CRISPR-Cas9 technologies, really allow you to uh, make target modifications across genomes of living cells. You really think about using the chromosome of living cells as the template for modification. So in thinking about this, as well as, as, well as also being inspired by some of the discussion from yesterday afternoon, uh, the way we like to think about engineering systems is really rooted in one where it's, where it's a biologically inspired approach. So you can imagine sort of context of natural selection evolution. You've got your uh, populations that could be subject to, to genetic variation, can create some altered genotype that could lead to some sort of altered phenotype that's clearly subject to some sort of environmental selection that will select for cells that are, are most fit and ultimately those will survive. You can think about creating, if you will, artificial Darwinian systems where you could now develop technologies that are inspired by this process of natural uh, selection that allow you to drive rapid and continuous modifications of whole genomes, really of living cells, um, and then deploy high throughput analytics. Clearly, you could use more instrumentation-based approaches such as sequencing, mass spec, facts, et cetera, but really thinking about embedding in cells systems of biomolecular sensors or detectors that can respond to these changes. And then you could think about taking that a step further by endowing them with the ability to self-select for desired phenotypes. So this is sort of like uh, more of a biologically insp inspired approach. And really the, the way we like to think about it as well is really engineering in the context of evolution. So I think you can have it both ways. You can think about developing models to really inform rational design, but also appreciating and leveraging the power of biology's ability to adapt and evolve and select for, uh, for, for phenotypes. So um, in many respects, uh, the MAGE technology encapsulates uh, this spirit, where the idea is to basically ha uh, design uh, synthetic pools of single-stranded uh, pieces of DNA, where you can effectively design these such that they can introduce target modifications across whole genomes. This was first developed in E. coli uh, with actually the goal of whole genome recoding, which I'll talk about in a minute. And what this allows us to do is site-specifically introduce uh, targeted mutations such that we can accumulate many mutations in a single genome as well as uh, sample combinatorial arrangements across the whole population. And this really allows us to target uh, uh, modification efforts at the gene level, so thinking about doing, for example, molecular evolution, being able to target things on the network or pathway level, uh, so allowing you to basically make uh, to multiplex a number of modifications across entire pathways as well as having the whole genome as a template for modification. How does, how does this technology work? Just want to take a minute to explain this to you. Uh, this really was inspired by a paper that I read out of Don Quartz's group, where he basically described this process where they introduced single-stranded DNA into E. coli cells that were modified with the ability to express a beta recombinase that would bind these single-stranded pieces of DNA, protect it from uh, nuclease degradation, as well as position it at the, at the uh, replication fork such that it could basically slide in, anneal right there, introduce its target mutation, and effectively prime like a Nokizaki fragment, and, and basically incorporate its modification at a very high, high efficiency. With this, I asked the question, could we basically scale this, improve this, and really make this a powerful technology to write genomes? And so that really uh, led basically to the uh, uh, development of the, of the MAGE technology, which allows us to basically take large pools of DNA and then effectively introduce them in a cyclical manner to populations that allow us to drive large-scale genome modifications. What's powerful about the technology is that this is done in a cyclical manner, so it can be done in a very iterative, quick way, uh, where basically each cycle is about two to, to two and a half hours, so uh, you could basically work, uh, if you go 24-7, to do this 10 cycles per day, or as many of you know, we've also uh, have developed and are continuing to work on automation solutions so that uh, this can be done in, in an autonomous way. 
But importantly, you can introduce diverse sets of mutations at high efficiencies. And depending on the way you design the experiment and the size of, the, of your oligo population as well as your cell population, we've shown you could basically generate billions of genomic variants per day. And really, using th the chromosome as that edible template for engineering and evolution. So now, armed with the ability to write genomes, what would, what would or could we sort of compose if you sort of were inspired by, let's say, uh, Beethoven's Symphony No. 9? So clearly, we could think about, as you've heard throughout the week, using these as, as technologies to uh, optimize and enhance the discovery of natural products. Uh, use this for bio-based production, chemicals, materials, fuels, drugs, et cetera. And actually, we uh, showed uh, the power of MAGE to re-engineer metabolic uh, pathways to enhance production of lycopene, similar in spirit to the one through and dial case. And obviously, there's lots of efforts now thinking about um, engineering organisms towards uh, uh, use for uh, clinical applications as well as environmental. So what I'd introduce you is the notion of using these technologies to create new genetic codes. And uh, before I go into what we've done, just want to remind everyone uh, about the genetic code and some of the key properties. So clearly, this is the uh, canonical genetic code. You've got your 64 codons, uh, the 20 amino acids that they encode, and the stop functionality. So what's important, and as you can see by this codon table, is uh, there's redundancy or degeneracy in the code, and that you've got more than one codon. For example, these four plus these additional two codons will code for serine. Um, and so basically, you've got this redundancy in the code. Importantly, the code is largely conserved uh, uh, across uh, all domains of life, with uh, a few exceptions. Um, but basically, you can, that really allows you to uh, exchange uh, uh, genes uh, between, species and, between species and really drives the ability for horizontal gene transfer events. And from a more uh, biotechnology perspective, it allows us to basically uh, expand and leverage the power of, re of recombinant DNA technology. Now, as we've heard a little bit in the previous talk and by many others, uh, there's been a lot of efforts to expand the genetic code with really a focus on engineering the components of translation. And it's really to encode non standard amino acids. I like to think about these non standard amino acids, also known as non canonical, that fall really into two main buckets. Those that are purely synthetic or unnatural, that don't exist in nature, and those that uh, can exist but only from uh, enzymatic post translational modifications of a natural amino acid. And people have basically, for example, out of the labs of David Terrell, have basically replaced a res residue uh, uh, from a native amino acid across the entire protein with a, close, with a close analog to encode these new amino acids in that manner. Others, uh, such as Pete Schultz, uh, Li Wang, Zhejiang Chin, my colleague Dieter Sol, have also used uh, site-specific incorporation of non-standard amino acids to introduce new chemistries into proteins, all really with the, with the goal of expanding the chemical repertoire of proteins, changing structure, stability, enzymatic activity, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to go into the details because we just heard uh, a good description of protein translation, but here's just a, a nice little graphic that shows natural protein translation. What I want to do is contrast that to what others have been doing in the context of basically developing orthogonal translation systems that will allow one to site specifically encode these non standard amino acids. It really comes down to having orthogonal amino acid tenor synthetases that will uniquely bind to these non-strand amino acids and charge in orthogonal tRNA that will then interact with EFTU and allow it to be encoded at the ribosome during the process of translation. Importantly, these are designed to be orthogonal, meaning that they won't cross-react with na native trans translational components or, or bind to the natural amino acids. Now, some of the challenges in this space is that, one, there's been no codon dedicated for 21st amino acid. And so uh, what's commonly used is, is using the UEG stop codon, as we just heard in the last talk. But what the one of the challenges is that this basically competes with the release factor 1 at the ribosome, which will basically drive the cleavage of the polypeptide and the release of the protein. So uh, a lot of the efforts really have been compromised by truncated proteins. On the flip side, what people have been, been basically doing is introducing high copy numbers of these systems 
dumping a lot of the amino acids to really drive the system. But the, then that, what that can do is that can basically cause the misincorporation of these non-strand amino acids at the greater than 300 native UEG sites across the genome, which causes a lot of toxic effects, which, which I'll touch upon later. Moreover, uh, a lot of the uh, orthogonal transition systems suffer from poor performance or really low enzymatic activity of these synthetases, and I'll touch more upon that later. But just to give you a sense, the typical uh, catalytic activity of these synthetases on the, is on the order of two to three logs below the natural amino, acid, amino acetylene synthetases. So partly inspired by this, uh, set out uh, about 10 years ago with the goal of uh, recoding the genetic code of E. coli. So here's the uh, coding usage table for E. coli, uh, the function that those codons encode, as well as the frequency of those codons throughout the genome. And the idea here is to really leverage some of the key principles of the code, conservation, degeneracy, to see if we could basically perform a genome-wide codon uh, reassignment. And the specific experiment that we first did was to basically try to uh, eliminate TAG by reassigning it to the synonymous TAA across the whole genome, creating an organism that's got 63 codons and has eliminated TAG from its genetic code. So you might be thinking about why would we want to be doing this? So there's a number of key reasons why. One, from a more of a biological perspective, is to really use this as a way to test the malleability of the genetic code. Could we actually, based on our understanding of the code, perform a whole genome-wide codon replacement? and moreover be able to then knock out the function of that codon in that, in that cell, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And then, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, inspired by some of that work on engineering orthogonal translation systems, could we now then reintroduce that codon as a dedicated open coding channel and site specifically incorporate non strand amino acids at that position, removed from some of the uh, challenges that I described just a minute ago. And then we had a few other goals and hypotheses is by virtue of having an, an, an alternate genetic code, would that allow us to create basically these genetic firewalls such that we could genetically isolate these organisms from other organisms or viruses in the environment? So for example, what would happen if we basically took viruses and tried to infect a recoded genome? Could that viral genome be properly expressed in the context of a recoded genome? And then lastly, could we then take this a step further by then creating uh, dependencies on synthetic amino acids for these organisms to grow as a way to address some of the challenges of intrinsic biocontainment. Okay, so how do we go about doing this? Just to give you a sense of what this project entailed, looking at uh, recoding E. coli by the numbers and biological constraints. First thing I want to point out is that you really have to think about this uh, considering both genome considerations as well as some of the translational considerations. So in the genome side, there are about 321 T TAG codons dispersed across the genome, about one TAG codon every uh, 14 kilobases. Seven of those genes are essential, and 39 of these TAGs reside in overlapping genes. So that means that uh, these could basically change the open reading frame of 39, 39 other genes. So these are some of the challenges we faced at the genome side. At the translational side, this is very important, is that when you think about recoding, you have to basically identify a mechanism and a path such that when you basically reassign your, U, your UAG to a UAA codon, you can basically eliminate the translational machinery that decodes that codon at the ribosome. And this is where we hypothesize that by recoding UAG to UAA, it would render RF1, which is, which is an essential protein, non-functional, allowing us to delete it while still retaining two stop codons that could be faithfully decoded by RF2. So that leads to the underlying key hypothesis behind this whole experiment, is that reassigning all UEG codons to UAA will render RF1 non-essential, eliminating natural UEG function, creating an alternate genetic code with 63 codons and a free codon that can be dedicated to a 21st amino acid. So with that, I'll just summarize what the key experiment involved. So, it's really three steps. So you start with your wild type E. coli with the full 64 codons, focusing on the stop codons that are decoded by RF1 and RF2. The first question is, could we basically perform a whole genome-wide codon replacement, resending all UAGs to UAAs? Followed by uh, addressing the question, could we eliminate UAG termination or its natural function by deleting release factor one? And then lastly, could we reassign UAG from a stop codon to a sense codon?
by basically introducing these orthogonal translation systems. So uh, this first um, challenge really inspired and led to the development of these technologies, uh, a mage of which I described earlier, a uh, cage which I won't describe, but in the interest of time, I'll just use this picture to illustrate what this experiment looked like. Effectively, what we did is we started from a wild type E. coli strain, divided up into 32 pools, where we basically used mage to make uh, 10 codon changes across each of those 32 strains simultaneously to ask the question, are all of these mutations permitted? And are any of them deleterious or, or synthetic? Once we confirmed that all those changes were achievable, we then basically developed this uh, conjugative assembly genome engineering technology that allowed us to hierarchically assemble the recoded regions across all 32 of these strains through five steps into the uh, chimeric genome that contained the full complement of the recoded uh, genome. And ultimately, we were able to show that we were able to recode all 321 uh, codons from UAG to UAA. That led to the really important question is, could we eliminate wild type UAG function? That is where we basically did the experiment to try to delete release factor one from a genome where all 320 codons were, uh, were recoded. And we basically benchmarked this first against some other strains that we and others had uh, developed in the literature. One were basically uh, Li Wang's group uh, mutated uh, RF2, so it had a gain of function, so that could basically decode uh, UAG. And what you can basically see here, and also there's a, a minimal set of, of genes that have been recoded, the seven essential, as well as six others that were shown to improve uh, fitness. But what's important here is if you look at a ratio of cells that contain release factor one versus those that don't, and look at their doubling times, only the strains that have been fully recoded really show no impact on growth. So this really, Allowed, it to, allowed us to conclude that the only essential function of release factor one was the peptidyl cleavage at UAG. And it confirmed our hypothesis that recoding all UAGs to UAA then allowed us to eliminate wild type UAG function. That led to the next experiment. Could we now build off of the work by um, uh, Pete Schultz, David Terrell, and colleagues and introduce orthogonal transition systems uh, and uh, reintroduce uh, that UAG codon? And what we found here, similar to what I just showed you a minute ago, is that only in the context of a recoded genome, and then here we're looking at doubling time as well as max OD, again, ratios of release factor one to release factor minus cells, do we basically see that the fully recoded genomes uh, are, are able to really faithfully encode these amino acids without impairing uh, growth? And what you can see is these other solutions, so significantly reduced um, fitness. And what we've later showed in the paper that described this is that uh, by and large what, you, what we actually have observed through mass spec is uh, a, a large number of suppression events by encoding these non amino acids at the many scores of UAG codons that reside in wild type backgrounds. Now if you look at our ability to use this to site specifically encode uh, these amino acids to proteins, what you can basically see is the recoded organism has the ability to encode really uh, scores of many, uh, new, many new amino acids. So you're, you're looking at 10, 20, or 30 site-specific incorporations into a single protein or a polymer. You can benchmark that against your wild-type tyrosine control. You can basically see we can produce these at levels that are on par with that, with, with the wild-type controls, versus your wild-type E. coli shows significantly attenuated ability to, to, to do so by and large due to the presence and competition from release factor one. So now what we've been doing is asking the question, what kinds of new biological function can we extract from organisms that have been recoded? And this is not just an opportunity to sort of think about some of the goals of recoding. It really inspired and led to the development of some very powerful genome engineering technologies. And now we're able to start addressing problems in genetic isolation, biocontainment, as well as the production of synthetic proteins and polymers. So first, I'll touch upon genetic isolation. So as I mentioned, one of the goals here is to see if we can engineer organisms that are isolated. One of one key experiment to, uh, in doing so is to test the ability of phage to infect uh, these recoded organ organisms. Here what I'm showing you is data from experiment looking at plaque area. 
we're looking at the uh, T7 infection uh, using your wild type E. coli as a control. So this is a metric of plaque area. We looked at a number of other metrics as well, but this gives us a baseline. So when you look at the recoded organism that contains the release factor one, it shows plaque areas that were basically equivalent to the wild type. However, when you knock out release factor one, you see a striking attenuation showing basically that when you eliminate UAG function, it basically isolates, create, creates this genetic isolation and leads to basically virus resistance. In uh, a number of experiments that we've done over the past year or so, we've actually shown this effect scales to multiple viruses, and hopefully that work will be uh, coming out over the, over, the next few month, over the next few months. From an applied perspective, what we're thinking about now is really using this as a way to apply this to uh, address some of the challenges of contamination in, some, in biofermentation that I mentioned earlier in my talk. Now, uh, thinking about this in the context of producing synthetic proteins and polymers, I showed you this before. We could basically drive many incorporations of non amino acids. But when you take these orthogonal transition systems and you introduce it into the chromosome, what you see is a striking decrease in the ability to encode and, and produce those GFP proteins. And really what this experiment does, it highlights the poor uh, catalytic activity of these amino acid synthesis, highlighting another major challenge in the field. And so this is where we turned to the development, basically, of a platform that starts with a crystal structure that can inform targets from eugenesis. Then we use MAGE now here as a molecular evolution technique tool to evolve the synthetase that's in the genome, specifically targeting uh, the amino acid binding pocket as well as the domains that interact with the tRNA and then uh, basically embed in this recorded organism selections that will select against uh, any cross reactions with the natural amino acids, and then we feed that basically into a high throughput fact sorting experiment to enrich for those variants that have increased uh, GFP suppression. And that's followed up by detailed biochemistry mass spec uh, validation. To make a long story short, basically what we, what we basically did is we targeted the molecular evolution of those two domains, and we find, for example, eightfold improvement in the amino, amino acid binding pocket, more of a moderate one and a half fold improvement in the domain that interacts with the tRNA, in particular the anticodon loop. You put them together, you get a synergistic improvement of 17 fold, and we show in a separate for a separate amino acid, a, a 25 fold improvement. And we then uh, further validated this through biochemical characterization. What this importantly allowed us to do is to drive site specific incorporation of many of these amino acids into proteins at high purity and yield. So now we're, we're able to, for the first time, produce new types of synthetic polymers. So, what we basically did have a postdoc who was trained previously in studying elastin-like polypeptides, which have been basically used for applications in drug delivery. And basically, these are basically these repeat pentapeptides where you've got these guest residue positions. And what we basically wanted to do is encode many instances of this DOPA amino acid, which strongly binds metals and inorganic materials. Um, and effectively, what we're showing you here is a new type of a synthetic polymer. And what this video is going to show you is a purified DOPA ELP solution that has many instances of this DOPA. You can see it can be easily pipetted up here. But once you expose it to this iron nitrate solution, it undergoes this immediate, uh, aggreg uh, this immediate aggregation and effectively forms this strong adhesive that's shown here. We're currently doing a lot of the detailed biophysical characterization, but we think this has really powerful applications as a new type of a biocompatible bio adhesive. And we're actually producing a whole class of polymers that are endowed with, with entirely new properties. What we're excited about is using recoded organisms really as living foundries for producing sequence-defined polymers that can't be made in natural biological systems, which are largely limited by the 20 canonical amino acids, but are powerful in that they're very precise and can basically produce polymers that are template directed, especially the ribosome. On the contrast, chemistry, you can produce lots of polymers with unlimited diversity, but they can't be done in a template directed manner. So what you want to basically do is in the context of recoded organisms is really leverage the powers of both of these, both of these uh, fields and start to produce entirely new classes of polymers uh, in a template directed manner for various uh, applications.
And I'll just close for the next few minutes in explaining how we've also leveraged recoded organisms to address problems in biocontainment. And basically here it's motivated by the prospect of the field of synthetic biology, more broadly industrial biotechnology, to transition from um, more closed system use to open systems where you can imagine engineering new types of probiotics or engineering organisms to address problems in environmental applications such as bioremediation, which require uh, biocontainment measures such that you can restrict their growth to define synthetic environments. And so starting with this recoded organisms that have these orthogonal trans transition systems, what we asked ourselves is could we basically reintroduce these UEG codons into multiple essential genes and then link their viability to an exogenous supply of synthetic amino acids such that uh, the production of these essential proteins requires uh, the incorporation of these synthetic amino acids. And so we first employed approaches where we basically just tried to introduce these synthetic amino acids right at the amino terminal of proteins, as well as using some computational design to identify tolerant sites that allowed us to basically achieve escape frequencies on the order of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 7, which are good, but really uh, don't show a significant improvement over uh, current state of the art or the kind of containment that we really need to address those other problems. Clearly, creating higher combinations of these TEG codons drive those escape frequencies down to about 10 to the minus 9, which is you know, going in the right direction, but uh, still uh, not, not where we want to be. Ultimately, we converged in a solution where we basically targeted conserved functional residues of multiple essential proteins, where, for example, if you focus on DNAA, which is an essential protein that initiates the process of DNA replication, it forms dimers in, in order to, to, towards their functional state. If we basically were replaced a uh, conserved tryptophan residue in the dimerization site with a paraxetophenylalanine, it allowed us to still retain the function of that uh, of that protein, but uh, which now depends on a synthetic amino acid. Upon doing that against a few other amino uh, few other proteins, we basically showed that we could uh, push the limit of escape frequency detection below actually our limit of detection, which is about a trillion cells. And this were planning lots and lots of cells and a lot of hard work by the people who are doing that. But what we what we found is that after about two days, these really uh, these small colonies with poor uh, uh, cells started to form. And when we signaled those genomes, we saw the formation of tyrosine amber suppressors. So then that led to the hypothesis that if we basically knocked out a tandem set of tyrosine amber suppressors, it would basically leave the cell with a single tyrosine amber suppressor that would be essential to retain uh, tyrosine incorporation during protein synthesis. And upon doing that, we basically were able to observe uh, no escape um, mutants in the context of about uh, a trillion cells over basically a seven-day experiment on plates, as well as about three weeks in liquid culture. So looking uh, ahead, we really think about now these recorded organisms as a, a new type of GMO that really addresses safety concerns. They're stable, and most importantly, they're immune to rescue by metabolic cross-feeding, which has compromised many types of biocontainment strategies uh, prior to this. What's interesting about this particular work is that it's now, uh, by creating these dependencies on these synthetic amino acids, it really requires these new types of synthetic biochem biochemical building blocks for viability. Um, and what's really exciting for us is, could this really establish a new basis for a synthetic molecular, molecular language capable of sampling new types of, 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 of evolutionary landscapes? So with that, I'll just close by summarizing some of the uh, take-home messages from our recoding efforts. One is that recoding is, is, is achievable. Uh, we basically were able to show that we could base, demonstrate the elimination of a wild-type codon function and reassignment to new function. And moreover, we're now using these recoded organisms as little factories or living foundries for producing natural and synthetic sequence-defined polymers for an array of new types of applications that we're really excited about and also show it how we could use these recorded organisms to address problems in biocontainment, genetic isolation, and virus resistance. More broadly, what you can see from the work that we're doing is uh, we're developing a whole host of new enabling technologies. I focus a lot of the genomic ones, but other types of biomolecular technologies with 
applications for engineering pathways and genomes, as well as uh, continually doing more recoding towards producing new and orthogonal biological systems uh, that now uh, are going beyond just E. coli into other microbes, communities, as well as eukaryotic systems. Um, with that, thank some of the key people who were uh, involved in this work. I first started the recoding effort while I was a postdoc with George Church with some collaborators down here. And since that time, uh, some students and postdocs of mine have really expanded it in those new directions I just recently described. So Alexis Rovner was important in the finishing of the recoding work as well as the um, biocontainment efforts in collaboration with Adrian Haimovich, who worked with Mira Amiram in some of the efforts on being able to evolve the uh, orthogonal translation systems towards the uh, encoding of many uh, amino acids. And Natalie has been working on the uh, genetic isolation and uh, virus resistance work. And with that, I'll thank all of you for your time and attention. Great, I think we're running a couple minutes ahead of schedule, so why don't we take a few questions for Farron on his talk before we start the discussion. Um, it's a great talk, and you introduced some very powerful um, tools for uh, whole genome editing, and as you said, that allows you to access a much wider um, or a much larger fraction of the sequence space. I was wondering if you can comment on whether there's any sort of general strategy on how you're actually going to screen through that sequence space if the thing that you're looking for is not tied to survival? Yeah, that's a good question. And so that sort of speaks to uh, that one slide I spoke about earlier where um, really think about biologic inspired solutions to engineering. And so if you think about that with some of these genome engineering technologies, you're right, we're really able now to drive um, large scale modifications across genomes, creating lots of genetic diversity. And that by extension will create a lot of different phenotypic outcomes. Um, and then the next challenges really are being able then to embed selection systems inside those cells where you could basically link those to, des to, to desired phenotypes and then self-select. So we are working on strategies based on protein evolution and, and um, engineered RNA molecules to go after that. And we have some promising results, but nothing that really is earth shattering just yet, but that's how we're thinking about going after the problem that you raised, which I think is sort of like the next technological challenge that we're facing right now. But there's still lots of things that we can um, still achieve in the absence of having those selection strategies um, in hand. So the mage technology allows you, you showed this about 30% or more than 30% efficiency. So I was wondering how finally you could replace all these amber stock codons and uh, solve this discrepancy to then allow 100% efficiency. So what was the trick? Well, when we report the efficiencies of the mage technology, it's think about it about in the context of, let's say you have, you have one oligo and you introduce them in population cells, we have 30% of the population will undergo that genetic modification. When you multiplex, you can increase that overall efficiency, but it will decrease a little bit on a per oligo basis. So what we basically do is we just basically do continuous cycling such that we can accumulate all the desired changes in a single genome, and that's how we get to the to all codons. Um, so, I mean, we were working on strategies of getting those efficiencies higher, and we have since we first reported that, um, but it's uh, it would be very difficult to, to get to 100 percent, although we're we're getting closer. Yeah. Yes. yeah maybe related to that question, uh, there is this uh, fast development of, of techniques in genome engineering uh, or genome editing. Uh, so, so would you do everything as you did in the first place if you would start today to uh, change your 321 uh, TAGs, or would you go for Cas Cas9 based systems? So it's a good question. So. Um, first of all, in terms of the ability to drive massively parallel modification, MAGE has a much higher ability to multiplex than Cas9, particularly in bacteria. Um, if you go to maybe eukaryotes, maybe you might opt for Cas9, or you'll see coming of our lab over the next year or so a, a MAGE type of a technology in, in eukaryotes. Um, we would, however, change the way we designed the experiment. Um, so you could see I described it as we basically 
divide the, the genome into 32 segments and recode it 10 at a time. Um, we would change the way we do that. We'd probably do that approach across probably <clears throat> four strains, and we could probably achieve that same uh, recording effort in under six months. Um, it's just that the, when we started this particular effort, these technologies didn't exist. We developed them along the way. But we would still use the same age technology, which allows us to drive massively parallel modifications and really explore combinatorics at a scale that goes beyond what CRISPR can do today. Maybe CRISPR can get there ultimately, but we would still opt for this in the context of E. coli. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Aaron, that was a great talk. Um, kind of in light of Kirsten's talk earlier, I was curious for T7 virus then, how many THEs is it in its genome or um, if you, you know, um, irradiated T7 and homogenized it, how many escapements were you able to get? It's a good question. So in T7, there are four genes that contain TAG. Um, and we think it really comes down to one of them, which is really essential in the vial formation of the, of the, of the envelope. Um, but we partly answered the second part of your question in the context of a few other viruses. Um, so for example, we did similar experiments with uh, Lambda M13 MS2 P1 and showed even greater degree of um, of, of viral um, uh, immunity. And what we did then is two, two important experiments. One is we created lysogens, recoded those viral TAGs to TAA, and showed that that then allowed them to uh, easily infect the recoded background. And the other experiment we did is we just then did, we subjected the, sort of created this um, adaptive evolution experiment where we continuously uh, um, uh, expose the, vi the, the cell to the virus. And ultimately, because of high mutation rates in viruses, the virus basically mutated different escape routes. So we observed, one, um, some uh, TAG codons in the virus convert to TAA. And in other instances, the penultimate codon in the virus co was converted to a TGA stop codon. Um, so that experiment is important for two reasons. One is that it's showing that the recoding does create these, these barriers and that currently viruses, because we're only you know, recoding a single stop codon, can overcome them. But it does establish the proof of concept that recoding, if you do additional forms of recoding, will create much stronger barriers to, um, to viral infection. So I would say stay tuned for those experiments. Yeah. Uh, my question is related to uh, that part of your work, which is related to uh, artificial extended genetic code. So, like I mentioned, the genetic code is redundant, it's highly redundant, probably, and uh, it's not clear, it's, at least a priori, it's not clear at all why it is redundant in that way and in, in some other way. And there is, a, at least, it's where a lot of work trying to somehow to explain and understand this redundancy. And some of this work, they're on the of numerology, I would say, but some of them are quite pretty much interested from mathematical viewpoint. So they try to, to model or explain it using some pretty much abstract mathematical machinery, like representation of representations of, of groups or things like that. So I'm wondering how this extended code fits uh, this picture. Uh, so maybe let me try to ask more concrete question. So when, when you modified genetic code, you were driven by purely biological uh, considerations or maybe more by some more abstract, you know, considerations taking <coughs> into account symmetry of some sort or something like that. Yeah, I mean, so you're sort of proposing some interesting philosophical questions in some ways. In terms of our motivation, um, we were, we were motivated from a biological perspective, you know, based on our understanding of the code and the redundancy and the, ge and the de degeneracy that you described. You know, is recoding possible? Um, and clearly, we show that. We were also really motivated by some of the new kinds of biology that we're uncovering with organisms that, with organisms that have been recoded. So, in many instances, it's a really interesting platform to maybe start asking, or start really answering some of the questions that you're pro that you're posing on on the code. We haven't really done that yet, and would be happy to talk to you about. Uh, ideas that you have. Right now, what we've been really focusing on is really leveraging the new types of properties these, these organisms have. 
Um, but clearly, with the ability now to make large-scale genome modifications and showing that recoding is possible, you could start to design experiments to go after uh, some interesting questions about you know, conservation of the code, codon usage. Um, to what extent can you really drive large-scale recoding across not just one, but let's say a few to maybe, let's say, a dozen codons? And how does that impact the code, the fitness of the organism, expression of genes, RNA secondary structures, all sorts of questions that you can start to address now in the context of understanding what led to the canonical code, what are the constraints, and how far can we push the system and really more towards you know, new types of functions. So I think there's all sorts of questions that you can, you can address. Um, we just, we're just at the beginning.